Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at ischemic heart disease. We're also going to focus on acute coronary syndromes like angina and myocardial infarction, MI, which we call a heart attack, and the associated ECG changes. Let's take a look. So to begin, we need to define what ischemic heart disease is. First thing, about ischemic heart disease is it's the biggest killer worldwide. So over 30% of Americans over the age of 35 will die of ischemic heart disease. So it's really important we understand the pathophysiology of this disorder. Now heart disease makes sense, it's a problem associated with the heart, but let's define ischemia. When I ask my students, what is ischemia? I get a number of different answers which are all correct, at least in part. And one of those answers is a drop in oxygen supply. So when I ask my students what is ischemia, some of the answers is a drop in oxygen. That's true, which we call hypoxia, but that's not only ischemia. Ischemia is, in addition to a drop in oxygen, it's also a drop in nutrient delivery, and it's also a drop in waste removal. And the reason why this is the case is because ischemia overall is a reduction in blood flow. And this is really important because if it was just hypoxia, just a drop in oxygen, yes, there would be problems, but we wouldn't get the significant problems we see in ischemia. There are conditions where we have low blood oxygen, like anemia, for example, and cyanotic heart disease, but we don't get the same effects as we do in ischemic heart disease. And it's because it's compounded by the fact that it's not just a drop in oxygen, but also a drop in nutrient delivery, and also a drop in waste removal from that area. So ischemia is an issue with blood flow, a decrease in blood flow to the heart muscle itself. Decrease, in this case, ischemic heart disease, decreased blood flow to the myocardium. And the myocardium is the heart muscle. Now we need to have a think about the blood vessels that feed the heart itself, which we call the coronary arteries. So I'm gonna draw up some of the coronary arteries because we're gonna go back to it because it's very important. So let's draw up here a heart. Yeah, that's not too bad. There's the apex, which is the pointy bottom. There's the base, strangely, which is the top. And we're gonna draw up the arteries that feed the myocardium. So the arteries that are gonna be affected here. Firstly, we've got the aorta. The aorta is gonna leave the heart. Now, at the base of the aorta, we're gonna have two little outflows. One's gonna provide us with the left coronary artery, and the other one's gonna provide us with the right coronary artery. So we're starting here, left, right. Now let's take a look. The left coronary artery, what you're gonna find, will branch pretty much straight away. So it has a branch that comes off like this, and that branch moves behind the heart as well, like that. I'll talk about what that's called in a sec. It also has a branch that goes down towards the apex of the heart. Now with the right coronary artery, the right actually moves its way all towards the right hand side of the heart and begins to spin its way around the back. But it also can have a branch that moves down the back of the heart towards the apex as well. So what we've got here now, there's many and there's other branches that come off these, but these three to four, you really need to understand when it comes to acute coronary syndromes, particularly MIs, heart attacks. So what are the names of these branches? So we're gonna have what we call the left circumflex, right? LCX, left circumflex. We're going to have the left anterior descending, sometimes known as the anterior interventricular artery, great name. We're gonna have the right coronary artery, which includes this around the back here, and we're going to add the posterior descending artery here. So this is important because you can just look at this and go, oh, I can sort of see where these blood vessels feed. Now these coronary arteries are epicardial. So remember, if we have a look at that, and this is going to be important later as well, everything's going to be important for later. If I have a bit of heart like that, cross section of a heart, and I've got the, a coronary here, you can see it's sitting up 
upon the outside of the heart. So let's say here's a layer of the outside of the heart. Here's the thick inside layer. And then here's the most internal layer, which is lining the inside of the chambers of the heart. So this is going to be epicardium. This is going to be myocardium. And this is going to be endo. Cardium. And here is a blood vessel, a coronary artery, that you can see they are epicardial. The coronary, at least the first couple of centimetres of them, and then they start to embed themselves and become intramyocardium. All right? The important thing is, in ischemic heart disease, most of the coronary arteries are affected at the epicardial portion, the ones that sort of sit on the outside. All right. So we've got these four you must know. Let's draw this in a different way. Let's do a bird's eye view of this. And let's take the heart. I'll draw it like this. Bird's eye view of the heart. And let's have the right and left. Right ventricle, left ventricle. We've sliced, we've done a transverse section. We're looking bird's eye view down into the heart. And we're gonna draw up these four coronary arteries. One, two, three, four. Let's name them. We've got the left circumflex. We've got the posterior descending artery. We've got the right coronary artery. And we've got the left anterior descending, sometimes known as the anterior interventricular artery. Let's have a look. This is all myocardium, right? This is all the thick muscular tissue of the heart. Let's see where it feeds. Let's start with the lad. Let's color the tissue that it feeds in purple. The lad is going to feed two thirds of this interventricular septum and most of the anterior wall of the left ventricle. So basically left uh, sorry, the two thirds of the septum and the anterior wall of the left ventricle. All right, let's take a look at the left circumflex. This one feeds the lateral wall of the left ventricle. Let's have a look at the right coronary artery. Now the right coronary artery will feed all of the right ventricular wall and also it will feed about one third of the posterior wall of the septum as well. And because remember the PDA is a branch of the right coronary. So sometimes you can talk about them together. You could say that the PDA with the right coronary artery will also feed the posterior inferior wall of the left ventricle. Now remember this is a bird's eye view of the top. We can't see what's happening further down. But we can see that the right coronary with the PDA will feed the posterior inferior wall, the back and down the bottom. All right. So now we can see where these arteries feed. This is super important because in ischemic heart disease, we've got reduced blood flow of these arteries. Now the question is, what is reducing the blood flow of these arteries? All right, let's take a look. Let's draw up the main causes of ischemia. Now there's one which is by far going to be the biggest cause of ischemia and that's what we call atherosclerosis. So let's write down atherosclerosis. Now we've done a video on atherosclerosis. These are lipid based or cholesterol based plaques that can form under the uh, lining of the blood vessel, which we call the endothelium. So think about the blood vessel. Just as a quick recap, you've got a blood vessel here and you've got epithelia. Remember one of the four tissues of the body, epithelia, connective, nervous and muscle. You've got epithelia lining the inside surface, smooth, flat cells that allow for the blood to move through smoothly. Perfect. In atherosclerosis, you actually get a buildup of fat underneath so remember the blood vessel is going to have multiple layers, right? So underneath here, you get a buildup of plaque, fatty tissue that occurs. And it forms this plaque. And you can still have the epithelia sitting on top of that plaque. Right? So that's an atherosclerotic plaque right here. 
So atherosclerosis is number one, more than 90% of ischemic heart disease is caused by atherosclerosis. Now if we take a look at atherosclerosis, there's two major types of atherosclerosis that can occur. So you can have the plaque that forms, so if we draw the blood vessel like this, and we draw a plaque like that, you can see that it's blocking part of the hollow lumen, the hollow inside. So that's just the hollow pipe of the blood vessel. We're looking through it like we're looking down a pipe. And you can see that you've got this plaque that's built up. Now, there's a type of atherosclerosis where the plaque has a cap on top of it, and it's what we call a stable plaque. It's stable, meaning, there's no indication that in the short term at least, it's going to rupture or get worse, in, at least in the short term, the acute phase. So it's stable. Now what this means is, think about it, this is one of these arteries feeding the muscle. Now at rest, that might be enough space for blood to get through to feed the myocardium at rest. But as soon as you increase the heart muscle's demand for oxygen. Now what can you do to increase the heart muscle's demand for oxygen? If you increase its heart rate or you increase its contractility, right? So anything that increases its cardiac output, the amount of blood it squirts out every minute, that's gonna increase its demand for oxygen and nutrients. Now the thing is, generally speaking, blood vessels can do this because they can relax and dilate and get bigger. But in this case, it's not going to help very much because it's still blocked. And if there's a blockage and it's the supply of oxygen and nutrients do not meet the demand, so here the demand goes up, but the supply has gone down, so it doesn't match, right? It's not a nice ratio. This results in ischemia, and this is what we call a stable plaque ischemia. And the ischemic event that we get is result, results in something called angina, which is chest pain. So this can result in what we call stable angina. I'll write ischemia first because it is ischemia, an ischemic event occurs. Ischemia, and this ischemia results in stable angina. Now angina as a term, sometimes you'll see it written as angina pectoris. That literally just means chest pain, right? So ischemia resulting in chest pain, the tissue is not getting oxygen and nutrients, the heart freaks out and sends signals via the nerves going, oh, I'm in pain. So you get chest pain, but you can also get jaw pain and it can radiate down the left-hand side of your arm, which we call referred pain. So this is angina pectoris, that chest pain. Now in this case, for stable angina, What's going to increase the heart rate contractility in cardiac? Put anything that increases exercise. So think about exercise or sympathetic nervous system stimulation. So what could do this? Exercise. That makes sense. Your heart rate goes up. But what else can increase heart rate contractility in cardiac output? Sympathetic nervous system. Your fight or flight system. Now what stimulates your sympathetic nervous system? Well, yes, exercise, but also stress and anxiety. And it doesn't just have to be uh, physical stress, it can be emotional stress. So some people can get stable angina from emotional stress. And that's important because the demand goes up, the blood can't feed the tissue, the tissue starts to become ischemic, it's not dying. It's not dying, it's just becoming ischemic, and you get the chest pain. Now. In stable angina, because that plaque's not getting worse, at least in the short term, if you stop the exercise and, and reduce that stress, it should resolve. And so it should all resolve within 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. Also, if you gave them something that vasodilates, opens that blood vessel up, like nitrates, then that should resolve it as well. So in stable angina, it should resolve once you stop the exercise, stop the emotional stress or physical stress and give somebody nitrates, something that can dilate the blood vessel or even calcium channel blockers. All right, that's stable. The other type of atherosclerosis is probably unsurprisingly the unstable. Now in the unstable, we've still got that plaque, but it doesn't have that nice cap on it. 
So something has disrupted that plaque and the disrupted cap and top of the plaque will expose the lipid insides to the blood that's moving through. Now remember, you've got platelets inside that blood that's moving through. And platelets are very sticky. They love to bind to anything that's presenting themselves. So in this case, in unstable, I'll write that first, in unstable, you'll have platelets accumulating, binding to and accumulating. And platelets, due to positive feedback, start to, one platelet will recruit another, which will recruit another and another, and it starts to form what we call a thrombus. A thrombus, which is like a blood clot. Now, as you can see, this thrombus can start to occlude or block the vessel. Now, this is going to be an acute short term, because this happens really quickly, right? So it bursts, it exposes itself, platelets come in, starts to block, 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 and it starts to occlude or block that vessel quickly. And it's unstable. Now, this quick change results in something called an acute coronary syndrome. So unstable can result in an acute coronary syndrome. And an acute coronary syndrome is unstable angina and MI, myocardial infarction. So this is death. Now in unstable angina, it's similar to this in the sense that it's just chest pain due to an unstable plaque. Now if it lasts too long, it can progress into a myocardial infarction because the infarct in this case is telling you that tissue is now dying. So here for stable angina, here for unstable angina, there's no death of the tissue. And that's important because if somebody comes in to present in the ED, in the emergency department, and they've got chest pain, and you're sitting there thinking, what could be the cause of this chest pain? You go through all your differential diagnoses, you go, oh, it could be reflux, it could be uh, trauma, it could be musculoskeletal, it could be, well, whatever you go through. If you take bloods and you have a look at certain levels of proteins that would get released during cell death, myocardial cell death, things like troponin, should be relatively negative for these two because there's no cell death. But if it progresses to MI, cell death, you'll see troponin. Now, the acute coronary syndrome is short term. No cell death, cell death. Now, I'm going to talk about MI in a sec because we're going to focus on it. But the unstable angina, the difference here, in, in addition to the thrombus that's formed, is that uh, it may not be induced by exercise or the sympathetic nervous system. It may not resolve if you stop those things either. That's important. It can last longer than stable angina, and it may or may not be benefited by vasodilators. Now, if we have a look, so this is 90% of the causes of ischemic heart disease. Let's have a look at a couple of other causes. So you've also got vasospasm. That's another cause of ischemic heart disease. Now, vasospasm is interesting. Vasospasm is when you've got your blood vessel and it spasms and constricts. So there's two major types of vasospasm. So let's draw the blood vessel and then it's constricting like that. And we can call this a transient vasospasm. So it's just happening short term. And you can have a more longer term vasospasm. So this is going to be a longer term or more severe vasospasm, uh, long term. All right, now what's the difference here? This transient vasospasm will result in chest pain, so angina, which we call Prins metal, Prins metal angina. So again, it's just saying it's, it's chest pain, but it's chest pain caused by a transient 
constriction, which means it should be fixed with the nitrates with the vasodilators. So three major types of angina, right? Stable angina, unstable angina, and Prinz metal angina. The severe longer term vasospasm, well, this can cause an MI because it will constrict for such a long period of time that it doesn't deliver the oxygen, nutrients, and waste, and therefore the tissue starts to die and have an infarct. All right, the last cause, or there's a couple of others, but the other major cause is going to be uh, microvascular dysfunction. Microvascular dysfunction. What we've spoken about so far are the macro vascular, the big blood vessels, right? The coronary arteries. But in this case, we're talking microvascular. So the capillary beds, or, the, or at least the smaller blood vessels. Now in this case, you can have quite severe. So in the, you can, let's just have the blood vessel. Here's the bed, the vascular bed, or at least the capillary bed. And you can have some damage that occurs to it. So let's just say, you know, a minor, relatively minor damage. What this can result is it works, can work on a background of these things. So it can contribute, it can contribute to acute coronary syndrome. Acute coronary syndrome. Now, the other one is a more severe microvascular damage and this severe microvascular damage can actually result in Takotsubo myopathy. Have you heard of Takotsubo myopathy? Takotsubo myopathy is broken heart syndrome or broken heart disease, sometimes called stress-induced myopathy. You ever heard of somebody, their loved one has died and they died of a broken heart? This is what they're referring to, Takotsubo myopathy. It can be due to a severe issue with the microvascular bed being damaged. We don't know how this is happening, but it can be a whole bunch of pro-inflammatory events occurring, resulting in the smaller blood vessels dying off, and it damages the left ventricle's ability to contract properly. So, as you can see with ischemic heart disease, atherosclerosis is the major cause, and then you've got all these others. I wanna focus on MI, because I wanna talk about how when we've got damage to the blood vessel, and we not only get ischemia, but death of the tissue, how we can pick this up on an ECG. So let's take a look. So when we talk about MIs, myocardial infarction, there's two major types, right? You can have what we call a, an n STEMI, and you can have what we call a STEMI. Now interestingly, they're named after what you see on an ECG. So n STEMI is non ST elevated myocardial infarction and a STEMI is an ST elevated myocardial infarction. So let's think back on an ECG. What do we see on an ECG? We can see a normal ECG, let's draw it in the middle, P, Q, R, S and T. So we've got the P wave, the Q, the R, the S, and the T wave on the ECG. Now this is what you generally see when you're looking at lead two on the ECG. Now let's just recap quickly of the different leads of an ECG. Here we've got the heart sitting within the chest. You can put chest leads on, you can put limb leads on. They give you views of the heart from an anterior posterior view, and the limb leads give you a view of the heart from superior inferior point of view as well. So if we were to just have a look at the precordial or chest leads and draw them up, they're gonna go around the heart like this. And you're gonna have V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. They're the chest leads. And they're looking at the heart from front to back. That's the perspective they have of the heart. Then you've got the limb leads. And these limb leads will look at the heart. You've got AVL, AVR, 
are AVF, lead one, lead two, and lead three. Remember, they're looking at the heart from this perspective, right? From this angle, this is where they're looking at the heart. All right, so in this particular lead trace here that we get, that's from lead two. So it's looking at the events happening in this direction of that lead, either towards or away from lead two. Now the interesting thing is with an n STEMI, what we get is a non-ST elevation, and you can actually get what looks like an ST depression. So you get a P, Q, R, S, T, like that. So what we see is the ST segment is depressed. And when we have a look at STEMI, what we get is a P, uh, uh, sorry, P, Q, R, S, T. And you get the ST elevation. How interesting. Why? What's the difference outside of the ECG? When we look at an end STEMI and draw the heart up itself, if this is going to be the heart for an end STEMI, there's the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. An end STEMI, the death, remember you're getting ischemia and then death of the tissue, it's happening, it doesn't have to be this particular position, but what you can see doesn't go the full width of the heart muscle itself. It goes from the sub, it goes from the endocardium, the subendocardium. So this is called subendocardial, endocardial ischemia, or infarct to be more specific in this case. So it's a subendocardial ischemia leading to infarct, but let's just write subendocardial infarct. As you can see, subendocardial, but let's draw it up here for this one, for the, for the STEMI. Same thing, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. For a STEMI, it goes the full width of the tissue, the infarct. So it's not subendocardial, it's tr it goes through the whole wall, and the term we use for that is transmural. Transmural infarct or ischemia. Now, because of these differences is the reason why we either get ST elevation or depression. Now before we go into the specifics of that, what we can do is, if you get an ECG trace right, you get how many lead Leads do you get on the ECG? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 lead ECG. 12 different views of the heart. And because of drawing it up like this, we can actually go, okay, I'm seeing an ST elevation in not all the leads, but some of the leads. Where is the death of the tissue happening? Is it happening there? Is it happening there? Is it happening there? Is it happening down here? Where is it happening? You can look at that through the ECG. So as you can see here, if you get death of the tissue, sorry, if you get in an ECG trace an ST elevation in V1, 2, 3, and 4, well, you can see V1, 2, 3, and 4 is looking at the septum or the anterior wall of the heart. So if you see ST elevation, now I've got to find a place to put this, Let's say you see ST elevation in V1 to V4, that tells you that there is some ischemic event of the septum or anterior wall of the heart. And we know that what is the vessel that feeds this part of the heart, the septum and anterior wall? It's the lad. So you can see that, oh, it's likely going to be a problem with an occlusion or blockage of the lad. Okay, let's have a look. What if you were to see something in V5, 6, and lead AVL and 1? So let's say we saw something in V5, V6, AVL, 
and lead one. Hmm, V5, V6, AVL and one. Well, it's telling me it's the lateral wall of the heart and we know that the lateral wall is fed by the left circumflex. So that's telling me that it's a lateral wall infarct. So the death is happening in the lateral wall, left lateral wall, and it's probably going to be the left circumflex. All right, what happens if we see ST elevation in leads three, AVF and two? Leads three, AVF and two. Well, that's telling us that it's the inferior wall of the heart. So the inferior wall. And we know that the inferior wall of the heart is going to be the right coronary artery and PDA. So we could say, well, it's the right coronary artery and or posterior descending artery. So hopefully this helps you because whether it's an ST depression that you see in these leads or an elevation in these leads, that's simply telling you it's either going to be subendocardial, not the full width, or transmural, the full width. And it can give you an indication as to not just where on the heart, but what vessel might be occluded. That's really, really helpful. Now, just very quickly to talk about why it is an ST elevation or an ST depression on the lead. It has to do with, once you have ischemia of these tissues, the ions that make up the, the myocardium, the cells itself, they change in regards to where they're sitting inside or outside the cell. So I'm just gonna quickly draw it up here. If you were to have the heart, and you've got lead two looking at it from here, and you can see lead two there, right? Where it's looking, looking at it from here. That's our trace lead that gives us that normally. If you've got a subendocardial death, so this tissue is undergoing ischemia first of all and then dying, we know that inside of our myocardial cells we've got heaps of potassium, right? But not much outside. If that cell dies, this potassium leaks out. Or even if it becomes ischemic, it leaks, it leaks out because there's ATP dependent channels that keep it in. If the ATP is gone, it opens up and potassium exits. Now when the potassium exits, it changes the excitability of these cells. And strangely, it makes them more excitable and they depolarize, which means that usually at rest, when no electrical event is happening at the heart, right? This part here, at rest, when no electrical event is happening, these cells are depolarizing early. Remember, that's the first depolarization event of the atria, that's the second of the ventricles. But if this is depolarizing early, that flat line that we see, which we call the isoelectric point, right? Which is that, if they depolarize early, that moves up. Which means, let's draw it up here, right? Here's the normal isoelectric point, right? that will draw that ECG on. But that's depolarizing early, and you can see it's depolarizing early in the direction of the lead, which means you get a bump up. So this first isoelectric point doesn't happen down here. The isoelectric point has moved up. So now the isoelectric point is here. And so in this case, with subendocardial infarct, you'll have a normal, you'll have, sorry, you'll have a P, Q, R, right, on this elevated isoelectric point, but then you get a normal S, T down here, and then it will drift back up because it's depolarizing early again, right? What do we get? ST depression. So in the subendocardial infarct, because depolarization is happening early in the direction of lead two in this case, what we get is an ST depression. But as you can see, this is, zero millivolts, this is where it should be. So in actual fact, it's not ST depression, it's everything else elevation, if you want it to be more accurate. So that's subendocardial infarct. Okay, what's happening if you've got transmural? So it's going the full length of the tissue. Well, think about it. The potassium is exiting and it's depolarizing these cells early, but it's depolarizing them away from the lead early. So let's draw it over here. Here's the normal 
isoelectric point, right? Zero millivolts. But because it's happening, depolarization is happening early away from the lead, our isoelectric point is lower. So now we've got our P, Q, and then as we get our R, then we get, as you can see here, right, it goes up, P, Q, R, S, T. So we get an, and then it drops back down to normal again. So we get an ST elevation in transmural. So hopefully this is helpful. We could talk about this all day, but this is ischemic heart disease, also known particularly when it comes to unstable angina myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, and some of the ways that you can make sense of it with ECGs. And I'm Dr. Mike. Thank you. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.